Okay, I'm going to do my best to make this somewhat interesting and scintillating, but you know, it's a long book and um, I'm not sure it's the most entertaining. So um, Joe mentioned this. I'm a child psychiatrist. I'm employed by Emory. I am the chair of the DeKalb CSB board. I've been on the board for a while. And I run around doing various educational activities when I'm happy to bore you with if you really would like some more detail about that. Um, so this is my first response to sort of having to deal with this whole problem in the middle of CPT coding as well. Um, and since I'm a child person, I like child-related things. Um, and because I'm a training director and work in an academic center, we're very good at taking a little fact and making you know, a four-page paper out of it. Um, so I think the thing I think is important to think about is it is true that this is a new improved version, uh, but it's not the only thing that's changing how we practice psychiatry and mental health. We have managed lots of changes in terms of how we think about providing care and what care means and what having a disorder means. Um, and I think that we sh as a field should try and use this opportunity to improve how we practice mental health, particularly in the area of assessment. Um, I will tell you that um, I have the luxury of running a training program and I get to say how long my trainees see patients in the systems I send them to. And it's always a struggle because I'm always busy saying you need to teach them a long way before you have them do it the short way. Um, but I do think this, we could use this as a way of thinking about this again. I am going to say that I have a tendency to use the word patience. It is just, I've tried to train myself to use other words and I really can't. Uh, so it's nothing negative. I'm a patient, so just so everybody knows. Okay, I think the deal is, you know, providing mental health care and understanding health care is very challenging. Um, I do that mostly with kids, but I think this is true across the lifespan. And I think one of the things that sometimes gets lost is you're trying to understand a person in their lives and how they fit in their environment and the context. And that we should be using the DSM and the diagnostic criteria to help us understand a person in their lives and understand what would be helpful to make their lives better. Um, and that it is not just sort of labeling them with a problem. And that sometimes, and I would argue often, particularly at the beginning of getting to know a person, that being efficient does not necessarily mean spending less time. Um, that spending the time at the beginning trying to understand what's going on often helps you down the road. And that sometimes it is not possible to really know what's happening with somebody in 50 minutes. Um, you know, that you just really can't capture it all even if the person is sitting there is only six years old. Um, because they're all, they also have the added problem of they, they can't really tell you what's going on. Okay, so just some things about, I'm going to go through and talk about some of, how, of the organizational things that they did, and then I'm going to try and go through the, the disorder categories and talk about how they changed it. We're going to put the slide set up. The slide set's incredibly long because I, I included every disorder. We're going to try and talk about the ones that are most relevant in the in this setting, um, so we're going to sort of skip over some of them. Okay. The, the manual is now, tr they tried to harmonize it with the ICD-11, which is the categorization system that the rest of the world uses. <laughs> uh, this would be in a category of one of the things that we in the United States and maybe Canada like to use different things than everybody else and don't want to change them. So um, the other thing they did is to try and do a better job of this issue of we, the DSM has put uh, mental, health, mental health disorders into categories. And as everybody knows, that is very challenging because they tend to be dimensional problems. And that you have to then draw a line and try and get draw a line about whether the person is got a problem, not a got a problem, is abnormal or just sort of struggling. Um, and trying to get them neatly into a category has proven challenging. And if um, I'm sure you've all had the experiences, people are ending up with 
not only does their diagnosis change depending on who they go see, but also they end up with four or five of them. Um, so the DSM-5 is attempting to do a better job of that so you don't have to, to give so many people so many different problems. And they try to reorganize the book so the disorders are together with disorders that make more sense. Um, and they're trying to sort of have a bridge and sort of a beginning thing, a uh, structure to go to new ways of thinking about figuring out some of the, um, the psychiatric disorders. Okay, they went to the, uh, the number five instead of the Roman numeral five. I think one is because we're all losing the ability to remember what the Roman numerals are. <laughs> um, but also because basically we can now go to 5.1, 5.2, 5.304 um, and have it be an easier process. Okay, so basically they decided again, sort of what I talked about is the categorical approach was too narrow and that they wanted to also try and get some uh, more consistency across the man manual. They use, I'm not going to run through, I'm just list, I'm listing them, I'm not going to run through them, but basically they use these 11 characteristics to try and sort what, what disorder should go where in sort of what category. They also tried to do a lifespan approach. They also tried to look at, is the, are the disorders internalizing, meaning that the person is primarily anxious and depressed or, and with physical symptoms, or are they busy running around bothering everybody and have more of an externalizing um, <laughs> disorder? Okay. And they tried this idea that they really reflect sort of abnormalities or derailments of developmental process that start early in life and continue through the lifespan. And so they tried to organize it with starting with childhood problems all the way through to uh, geriatric or older age problems. It isn't, they took, couldn't totally get there, but I have to say it works better than the previous version. So for example, there is no longer a section that says disorders in childhood. Uh, they basically, they just, uh, anybody can get any disorder and they have tried to do a better job of, of including developmentally appropriate language and descriptions into the disorders. Okay. okay. Um, and then this is sort of the order they put them in. Okay. So the first section of the book, they have, that's the introduction section where they sort of talk about that. Then they have a section that they've called the basics. And they go over the brief history of the DSM. I'm going to skip that. They have a nice description of that if you'd like to read about how they did it. Then they describe how they figured out the DSM-5. And then they talk about the, stru the structure. They've also consistently tried to put in cultural information and gender information into every disorder that it seemed relevant. Then they have decided they got rid of the uh, not otherwise specified um, category. So all of those disorders went out. So those of us who are practitioners, those disorders got used if you, could, the per you thought this person was in this category, so you thought they had, had some form of depression, but they didn't meet the criteria of the de specific depressive disorders, so then they got an NOS. So they have gone to a model where you can either, you, if they don't meet the criteria, you either say they're specified, it's a specified or unspecified, I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. And then they got rid of the multi axial system. The argument for getting rid of it is that people functionally weren't really using it. And the argument is that you should just list every problem that is relevant that this person is having. Um, and you do, and there shouldn't be this implied hierarchy of what problem is most important. You should just do that yourself in terms of whatever your problem list is. And then they provided lots of stuff online, uh, not to trash the APA, which is the American Psychiatric Association who produces the book. There is, there is um, much of it, some of it's free. There's a lot of it you can pay for. Okay. <laughs> um, so they also tried to discuss in the, how to best use the manual, and so there is a section that discusses how do you use various pieces of information to develop a formulation or a sort of comprehensive understanding of a person and their problems. They also have a section on defining mental disorders and what should be included when you are making a diagnosis. 
And then they talk about, um, they have a section about sort of different types of assessment and monitoring tools that they would like the field to start using. And then they have a nice section about cautionary, uh, you know, aspects of using the DSM-5 in the forensic juvenile, I mean, uh, ju uh, justice system. Okay, so I think, um, just talk about the assessment system a little bit. Okay, so they basically are arguing about why we're not gonna do the DSM, we're not gonna do axes one through five anymore, is that many of these problems share, uh, have common physical and biological factors they are all are relevant to people's mental functioning and that it's sort of an artificial distinction. And so, so you now just list every problem. And if you think hypertension is the second most important problem, it gets to be second on the list as opposed to on the separate axes. You still are supposed to code um, psychosocial problems but they again are just either noted in your note or you put them on the same, you just put them on the list. They have expanded how many, what kinds of factors you can consider, and I have them listed later on, but they also made them compatible with the ICD-9 and the ICD-10. And then five was supposed to capture disability and sort of impair, um, level of functioning. So they got rid of that with the argument of having a disorder is separate from being disabled. So there's no more GAF. We don't do that anymore. The other argument about the GAF was it wasn't very useful scale, and it sort of mixed up lots of different things, and that it was hard to know. People tended to use it very, it, I can tell you this from myself and training lots of people, it tends to get used very, very <laughs> idiosyncratically. Um, and they have included in the DSM in um, a uh, further section an, an assessment scale that's used by the WHO that they feel is sort of a better capture. And the idea is you would do this scale with a person you were seeing and then just basically describe where you think they are. They also have done a more systematic job of when you give a person a disorder is uh, coding sort of where you think their impairment is. Okay. Um, sort of went over. I'm talking ahead of myself. Okay. So they've done, all, uh, most disorders have a lot more specifiers than they did in four. Um, that, that you can describe how severe they are. You can give indications about whether this person has any insight into their problems. The environment ones are more around things like substance abuse and eating disorders. So for example, are they in remission, but in a structured environment. Um, and then you can code whether they're in any kind of remission or not. So if they don't meet full criteria, so you can only do that if they meet full criteria. If they don't meet full criteria, then you are supposed to code them as either other specified or unspecified. So those of us who are somewhat cynical believe that we now have two choices because to get, to do other specified, the clinician has to write down why they don't meet the disorder. So someone has to, in the chart, say, or and when you code, say, um, other specified depressive disorder, uh, you know, doesn't meet duration criteria, doesn't meet, you know, uh, doesn't have enough symptoms. If you don't want to do that, then you give them unspecified disorder, and you don't actually have to write down the reason why they don't have the what, why they don't meet the criteria. Okay. So they also, um, with some disorders, allow you to do subtypes. Um, they're both, depending on the disorder, they're both either exclusive or jointly exhaustive, trying to sort of group different sub subtypes of disorders in, in terms of how they look or how they behave. Um, and you can also specify, have specifiers like it's, uh, so, for example, in the autism spect uh, spectrum disorder, you can qualify whether they have intellectual disability or not. You can give people provisional diagnoses. Um, and then they continue to have exclusions where you can't give a person a di this uh, one diagnosis if they have another diagnosis. Okay. And for all, so for all of them, you, there's a whole set of classifications for if you think the problem is really related to either substance use or some kind of medical problem. Okay, 
all diagnoses require some level of distress, meaning that the person is in distress or they have some level of impairment. Right. And uh, again, the sort of medical stuff. The codes match the DSM-9, I'm sorry, the ICD-9 and the ICD-10. The United States is going to adopt the ICD-10 in October of 14. That's about the same time the rest of the world will be adopting the ICD-11. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure what the plan is. I mean, I would assume subsequent versions of the five will try and catch up. Um, and while I've heard the argument about why we just didn't go straight to 11, I don't really remember it, and it's probably not. It's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it strikes you as sort of unbelievable that all these intelligent people couldn't figure it out. OK. So in the disorder section, with every disorder that this seems possibly relevant, you can code them as the problem being due to a medication or substance. So basically, they have to have the disorder symptoms. They have to have evidence based on a physical exam, a lab, or a history that's related to a medical problem or substance. And then you code whether, in the use of substance problems, you code whether it's with or without a disorder, right? And then you can code what type of problem they're having. So for example, you would say, you know, substance-induced psychotic disorder, or you'd say, you know, medication-induced depressive disorder. Okay, same thing with other medical condition. You can say psycho psychotic disorder due to another medical condition and so similar require, uh, criteria. Okay, so then this uh, disorder section starts with neurodevelopment. So it starts with neuro intellectual disabilities. So intellectual disabilities is what we used to call mental retardation. So we changed the name because basically in the United States, legally and in the educational system, people are, are classified as intellectually disabled. It also, in parentheses, has intellectual developmental disorder because that's what the ICD um, calls it. So uh, just, so it, yeah. So once again, we just have to have our own name. So um, basically, again, it's this, the core um, issues are the same. You have to have some kind of deficit in intellectual functioning, and you have to have some problem in adaptive functioning. It has to have occurred in the developmental period. OK, so there's no more age requirements. And you, are, you code severity based on how adaptive they are in their environment, not based on their IQ. And you code them as mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And you do it in each of these areas. So it's conceptual, social, and practical. And what the DSM-5 does is it has this nice little chart with all these little words in it where you have to read through the whole par paragraph and say, OK, the, my, the person I'm seeing fits this category and, and is mild. OK. Then for the people where you can't really assess them, they gave two diagnoses. So one is global developmental delay. That's if you're under five and essentially you can't be assessed. And unspecified is if you're over five. And both of them have you know, strongly worded language that you should keep trying to assess them. OK, so basically what changed is we changed the name. We made it a developmental period. We increase the emphasis on how, how well you function, and then that's how we're coding severity. OK. We also sort of re, renamed and reorganized the uh, learning disorder section. So there is now a disorder called language disorder. And basically, it's talking about the difficulties in acquiring and using language across different uh, types of activities. So we're talking about written. We're talking about verbal, OK? That you are below the age you should be based on your developmental level. It is impairing you. And again, it happens early in the developmental period. We have speech sound disorder, which basically means you have trouble articulating and speaking in a manner that people can understand you. And that, again, this is getting in the way of you communicating. And again, it starts early in life. We have childhood onset fluency disorder, which is what we used to call stuttering. Um, and again, this is just around f speech fluency. 
and that uh, you know it's inappropriate for age and how well your how good your language is, and that it's impairing. Okay, and the big new one is social pragmatic communication disorder. So this is the idea that you have trouble with the social use of language, either verbal or nonverbal. So these are essentially these are essentially the Asperger's kids, right, where their language is fine, but they somehow miss the nuances of it and can't understand what people are saying. So, um, you know, for example, when people say, how are you, in most social settings, what they mean is, I want you to say, I'm OK. They do not want you to say, oh, let me tell you about all of my problems, right? Um, and, but, but these people don't really get that, right? Or people, you know, one of my favorites, and since I see kids, I hear this all the time, are kids where they don't understand when you say to a girl, you know, let's go, let's get together sometime, and the girl says, oh, I'll get back to you, right? Well, that really means go away. Um, and that, but they don't get that. Okay. Um, we'll talk, this is an attempt to, to deal with the problem that we're having in the field that there are all these individuals who clearly are having trouble in the social arena, but actually in other areas of our lives are pretty functional and actually do seem to not quite fit the autism spectrum criteria. Um, so this is an attempt to sort of capture those people. Okay, so we changed a couple of the names. We consolidated a couple of the disorders, okay, and we developed this pragmatic um, communication disorder. Okay, so the one that got a lot of press is the autism spectrum one. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this. This essentially is, we ha there are the same, the criteria are essentially the same. Um, again, the di what they did is they like, collapsed all the disorders. So it used to be in the autism uh, disorder section, there were a number of different disorders. And depending on how old you were, depending on what your language looked like, depending on whether you had certain characteristics, you got different disorders. Some of these really had no functional use and really were just an artificial. So for example, you know, part of the problem was you'd have an autistic kid, but they didn't meet the age requirement so because they hadn't had an onset early enough. Um, or um, another problem is we used to diagnose RETS, but we've actually discovered the genetic uh, reason for RETS. So RETS is now a neurological problem. We don't have it anymore. Um, so um, again, you. Uh, the main difference is that they collapsed it. You either get to be autistic or not. Um, they basically look at how much support you need to classify how functional you are. And so basically for each area, so basically both in social and in your pattern of behavior, you look at whether the kid need, or the person needs how much support they need, and then you look at and then you can specify. So you can specify whether they have an intellectual impairment, whether they have a language problem, whether they have a medical or genetic problem. Um, OK, so Asperger's has gone away. OK. They do have a section in there, a qualifier in there, saying that everyone who met the criteria in the four should get the diagnosis in five until they, they sort of, as a default diagnosis, until things are sorted out. Um, okay, so attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, again, the core uh, criteria and symptoms pretty much stayed the same. The main difference is that instead of the cutoff being seven, the cutoff is now age 12, and that adults are allowed to have fewer symptoms and still meet the criteria. Um, and you, again, you code them whether the, how severe they are and whether they're in any kind of remission. Okay, they give, in the manual, they give more examples of what different age people might look at because the problem with the four description is if you were a boy between six and 12, it was a great description of you. And if you were not in that group, it was a terrible description. 
Um, so it, the new sort of language and descriptions are trying to get at helping people decide when this 30-year-old walks in your office who runs a company and tells you they have ADHD and that's what the problem is, you have some better ideas of what, what that might mean and how to think about that. Um, and you can give this diagnosis with autism. You used to not be able to, but again, it has to be where you think it's more than what would be explained from just being autistic. Okay, we now have specific learning disorder. And this basically is the category of, are you having some sort of trouble with skills that are required in academic settings? So basically, you know, this is reading. This is being able to understand what people are talking about, either written or verbal. Um, you know, being able to spell. Can you write things down? Do you understand numbers? Can you reason in math? You now have to have the problem um, for at least six months, despite people trying to help you. This has to do with, um, so this is a category of problems that, um, so we in psychiatry have a specific way of thinking about them and, and organizing them, which does not match how they do it in education or the people who actually study learning disorders. So this is an attempt to sort of meet this somewhat. In the educational world, um, kids are only thought to be lear have learning problems if they fail what is now called, what is called response to intervention. What that means is this is the idea that these are spectrum problems and that basically the kids who are reading disabled actually don't look that different from kids who are struggling to learn to read. They're just a little further along the spectrum and that um, for and the, the interventions you use to help them read are the same. So in this model, you, get, you try and intervene and give the kid extra help in a regular classroom, for example, and only the kids who still are impaired at the end of that meet the criteria for having a learning disability. Has to start in the school age period, even if you don't notice it until later. And then you specify whether it's a reading problem, a written expression problem, or a mathematics problem. So they're used to, they used to be different disorders. Okay, so they've combined them and then you just specify. This is to target the problem of kids were ending up with multiple learning problems because often it overlapped. Okay, we have this um, disorder uh, called developmental coordination disorder. It basically means you're uncoordinated and clumsy more than would be expected for your age. Um, I will say that most of us in mental health don't use this much. Uh, we suspect you just, they just had to have one because you know they've talked all about this cognitive problems and we forgot the motor system. But, <laughs> the, the bottom line is most of these kids are actually not in not getting mental health, and if they are getting mental health services, they usually have another problem that explains why they're clumsy and uncoordinated, but you can give it to people if you want. Then there's a stereotypic movement disorder that basically talks about you just have this repetitive, which seemingly driven motor behavior that it gets in the way of things. It starts early on, and you can code it as with you know, with or without some injurious behavior associated with some other problem um, and severity. Well, this is, can be seen in anybody. It actually is mostly seen in individuals who have some sort of uh, major global developmental delay. Okay, and then the tics disorders pretty much stay the same. So you can have Tourette's, that means you have motor and vocal tics. They're present at some time, but you have to have both. It lasts more than a year and it happens before, you're, before you are 18, and then you can have either just motor or just vocal tics. Um, you can now specify, so that you now specify that, that you, uh, they're not specifiers to the stereotypic movement disorder, and they standardize. Uh, before in the DSM-4, depending on where you chose to read about tics, it was slightly different. <laughs> now it's sort of all the same across the, board, uh, across the book. Okay, so that's the neurodevelopment section, which uh, starts off the book because the thought is that even if you don't notice it uh, early, it starts early. And, the, and there's more flexibility about allowing people to give a diagnosis. So you can give someone a diagnosis of autism even if they show up at 12 because the cur their problem sort of is... Um, so, for example, the high-functioning autistic kids who don't start having trouble till middle school when it's very, you're so, you need good social skills to survive middle school, right? And um, so they're more flexible about that. Okay, the next category is um, 
the schizophrenic category? Okay. So again, to be schizophrenic or psychotic, you have to have these key symptoms in these categories. Okay. Um, again, they're, delusional disorders, basically you're delusional, but you're functional. And then you now just specify what kind of delusions you have. You can specify with or with, with bizarre content. You specify where they are in terms of the number of episodes. You specify whether they're in remission or continuous and then severity. This severity is by how many symptoms you ha happen to have in the last week. Brief psychotic disorder, um, again, is pretty similar criteria. And then you just specify whether they have a stressor or not, whether it's after having a baby, whether you're also catatonic, and you, you do severity by how many symptoms they have. Uh, schizophreniform. Um, you, again, the major criteria are pretty similar. You specify whether they have good or they are with or without good prognostic features and with, whether they're catatonic or not and how many symptoms they have. Okay. So schizophrenia, they made a little simpler. So you have to have these two, you have to have more, two or more symptoms. You have to have it for a significant period of time. At least one of them has to be this list right here. Um, you have to be impaired. You have to have some level of symptomatology for at least six months. And then you specify where there's the first episode, multiple episodes, continuous, what level of remission if you're catatonic, and what your primary symptoms are for severity. Um, and then schizoaffective. Schizoaffective, they emphasized more that you have to have be psychotic without mood problems, and that you also have to have mood problems most of the time. And then again, they just broaden how, what kind of specifiers you have. Okay. And then they uh, started a disorder that basically says you're catatonic, and you are catatonic with a, another mental health problem, or you are catatonic because you have a medical problem. Okay. So basically, the major changes are you don't have to be bizarre. You don't have to be non-bizarre to be delu have delusional disorder. Um, schizophrenia, they got rid of the subtypes. So we used to say schizophrenic paranoid type, schizophrenic unspecified. That really didn't seem to make any difference in terms of predicting how people did or predicting how they would uh, respond to treatment or how functional they were. And as you might guess, People varied on what subtype they liked the best, and so you know there was no validity across you know different people diagnosing or reliability. Okay, we no longer um, consider bizarre delusions special, so they just get to be part of the delusion criteria. And we used to care a lot about whether they had auditory hallucinations where two voices talk to each other. Um, while that still counts, they also are no longer special. Um, and that basically you have to have, uh, you know, two of the major criteria and then you have to, you have, to have either delu delusions, hallucination, or be disorganized. Um, they, in this third section, which we'll get to, which is basically suggested activities for people, is they suggested a, a rating scale that people can use, but it is not a requirement. Um, this is a rating scale specifically for psychosis. Okay. They made schizoaffective a little more longitudinal, and it's in terms of the descriptions of the criteria, it's more comparable to how we describe schizophrenia, bipolar, and major depressive disorder. Okay, and you really have to have mood, significant mood symptoms most of the time. Okay, and then catatonia, they standardize the description across the manual. You can specify it with other disorders, and then it can, you can be a free, it can be a freestanding problem as well. Okay, so then we move into bipolar and related disorders. Okay, so uh, again, the description for mania is pretty similar. They inc there's more emphasis on sort of energy and activity. Okay, um, there's also again the hypomanic description. Okay, and the major depressive episode. Okay, so the main difference, and this is the one that made the press, is that you can 
meet the criteria for having a major depressive disorder in the midst of what are considered major stressors. So for example, you, if you were bereaved, you in the past could not be diagnosed with major depressive disorder because there was this concern that you, it, normal grief would be confused with getting a psychiatric <coughs> illness di diagnosis. Um, there's lots of debate about this. The people who are in support of this basically are arguing with some legitimacy that there are, you can, if you, if you know enough about the person and what's going on, you can distinguish normal grief in, even in the context of bereavement and give people this additional diagnosis. And the argument for doing this is basically to give people access to treatment um, and sort of help. But again, it's, bereavement is the one that got talked about the most, but actually you can give people this diagnosis in the midst of any major catastrophe you'd like to think about, you know, disasters, illness, disability, whereas before you could not. Okay, so bipolar one is pretty much the same. More specifiers, so you can, you can um, particularly around sort of, it can be with the anxiety, with mixed features, rapid cycling, melancholic, I won't go through the whole list, but there's you know, quite, a bit, quite a few choices now. Um, again, you're coding about severity, and you code whether they're psychotic or not, um, and you code uh, where they are with remission. Bipolar two, similar, many more specifiers. Uh, cyclothymic, uh, pretty much very similar. Uh, you can specify whether they have anxious distress. Okay. So what they changed was in the manic on hypomanic, more emphasis on increased energy and activity and sort of added more specifiers. Um, okay, so in the depressive category, uh, this also is, was a, has been a favorite uh, topic of discussion, particularly in child. So we now have this disorder that is called the disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, a catchy title. So this is to target the problem we've had in child where, um, so in child for a long time, we thought that people who uh, were not adolescent, so meaning they were essentially below the age of 12, could not have certain disorders. And then two that sort of most, uh, so for example, we thought they couldn't be depressed and we thought they couldn't be bipolar. So approximately 25 years ago, we changed our minds about being depressed and decided that kids could be depressed. Um, and then within the last like 15 years, we've had this debate about uh, we decided they could be bipolar. Um, but then we called lots of people bipolar. Um, and there was sort of this debate about what does a six-year-old look like who is bipolar? Right. With lots of different ideas about um, how that might work and how that might look. And essentially, the field ended up in two camps. So one camp was essentially the camp that said, you can be bipolar if you meet the criteria for a bipolar, developmentally insensitive though they are. Um, or, and then the other camp that argued they're so developmentally insensitive it doesn't, they, you can't use that as diagnostic criteria and you can be bipolar if you are an incredibly irritable, overactive, uh, sort of out of control kid and you specifically do not have to meet the criteria for mood problems or mood instability and you do not have to meet the criteria for episodes. So you could sort of be this way all the time and still be bipolar. I won't go, I won't digress into why that camp lost, but they essentially lost. And so we now pretty much have a consensus through most of the field that you can only be bipolar if you meet the criteria. The criteria in the five have made an attempt to be more developmentally sensitive, but the bottom line is if you're seven, you can, you, if you meet the criteria for bipolar disease, you get to be bipolar. Um, but if you don't, then you have to be something else. So this is a category to try and capture these kids who are clearly impaired but, and having trouble, but don't meet the criteria, that they seem to have mood instability, that they have lots of uh, self-regulation problems, they have lots of sort of behavioral problems, they're very irritable and very angry, um, so this is a new diagnosis. Uh, even before we started using it, there was lots of debate about it, but this is, we're sort of gonna try this and see if this works better for us and everybody else. 
So the bottom line is it can't be one of those difficult kids who's just decided to give you a hard time. The kid has to be consistently like this. The kid has to have been like this for at least a year. Cannot have more, um, cannot have significant periods with no symptoms. Has to have symptoms in multiple settings to sort of target, try and um, not include the kids where their problem is just at school or just at home, okay? You have to have this problem before you turn 10. You can't have it before you become six because as all of you know who hang out with kids under six, they'd all qualify for a psychiatric disorder. Um, you know, so, you, um, and you can't give people this diagnosis if they're over 18. And you also can't have it if you're oppositional defiant, if you have intermittent explosive disorder or, you're, or you are actually bipolar. Okay. Um, so major depressive disorder, we talked about a little bit of the changes. Again, there are more specifiers for it. Okay, we um, got rid of a, uh, basically we got rid of, well, we renamed dyslimia and added, we, we actually have a diagnosis that is called chronic major depressive disorder, although no one seemed to actually get it. So those are now called, the, two of them are essentially persistent depressive disorder, which is trying to capture people who are depressed but don't meet the, but it's chronic and they don't meet the criteria for major depression all the time. Okay, and again, you can specify. Okay, premenstrual dysphoric disorder made it out of the study section, which is where it was in DSM-4. So it is now a real disorder. And basically, again, you just have to have mood symptoms that are in conjunction with you having a period Okay, and that they have to be impairing. Okay, so again, they added the mood dysregulation disorder. They they changed the idea of how you know how when people can be depressed and um, you know that you don't have to be um, depressed with you know no problems, and they moved us for you know premenstrual and then they collapsed uh, chronic major and dysthymic disorder. Okay, so the anxiety disorders. So separation anxiety disorder used to be a disorder that essentially we only used in childhood. And basically the deal is you're anxious, but it's all around being separated from the people you're attached to. They have broadened the descriptions and now you can give the diagnosis to, and, and they've given you sort of examples for people who are adults. It has to last longer in adults. Um, and again, this is sort of, it has to be impairing and it has to be persistent. This is to get over the, you know, you cart the kid off to daycare at age three. They've never been separated from you. They're a little distraught and they're kind of distraught for a couple, you know, a while to try and not get those kids in this category. And uh, you, ha I'm sorry, you have to be, your anxiety has to be around being separated from your caretaker or the people you're um, involved with. Okay, selective mutism, again, is this idea you don't talk in social situations where you actually do have language and you talk. So the most common one is kids talk at home, but they don't talk at school. And you can't diagnose in the first month of school, and the kid does not have a language or speech problem. Okay, specific phobia is basically, you know, it's the spider thing and the elevator thing. Um, again, it has to be out of proportion. Um, it has to be impairing. And now you just specify whether it's an animal or a natural environment or blood. Um, we've gotten rid of all those nice names, those Latin names that none of us remember or can spell. Um, okay, and then now we have sort of social anxiety disorder, which is also social phobia. Again, this is being anxious and phobic around social situations. Okay, and for kids, it must be around being anxious around their peers, not being anxious about adults. Okay, um, and again, it has to be persistent and it has to be impairment and impairment, and you can specify if it's performance only. Okay, so panic disorder, um, again, it's sort of recurrent panic um, attacks. They've standardized the description of what a panic attack might be. Okay, and that you have to have pers you know persistent repetitive um, attacks. Okay, agoraphobia has been separated from panic disorder, so it's now you now don't code them together. And this again is this idea that you don't want to leave your house. 
and there are various places you don't want to be. Okay, again, it has to be impairing and out of proportion for um, you know, what's going on in your developmental level. Okay, general anxiety disorder is pretty much the same. Um, and again, it has to be impairing and it has to be across the board. You're anxious about multiple things in multiple situations. Okay. So what happened is OCD and PTSD got moved out of the anxiety disorder category. We moved in selective mutism and separation anxiety, which used to be in the childhood section. Okay, we made separation anxiety. It's possible now to be an adult and be separation have separation anxiety. Um, okay, for phobia, you no longer have to recognize that your fear is excessive, and now everybody has to have had the problem for six months. Okay, social anxiety, they just added a um, specify, the spe they changed the specifiers. Okay, panic attack, standard criteria. You can now specify it as a, as a uh, for multiple other disorders. Okay, so you don't have to give a person panic disorder and something else. You can give them the other disorder and just say they have panic attacks. Okay, and they unlinked panic disorder and agoraphobia. Okay, so OCD gets its own category. Um, the description of OTD is pretty much similar to how it used to be. There's um, added sort of ways of specifying their level of insight. Um, and now you can specify whether they have tics or not. Um, body dysmorphic disorder got moved into this category. It used to be in the somatic disorders category. Um, and now it has more specifiers. So just so everybody knows, muscle dysmorphia is this concern that you aren't strong enough and sort of your muscles aren't um, strong enough and don't look good enough and um, evidently it's quite common in body dysmorphic disorder. Um, and then you can specify their insight. Okay, we now have hoarding disorder. Okay, so the argument about this is that while there are some similarities, it is thought by the people who research this that it really is a different disorder and you have a different chemistry and biology underneath it. And this is the idea that you can't get rid of anything um, and that you're very distressed and that sort of it ruins your lives as we all know from all the you know, various TV shows that seem to find all these people to film, which is sort of unbelievable. But anyway, um, again, you can specify whether they just, you know, whether they, it's the problem is they get too much stuff. You can specify their insight you know, whether they're delusional or not. And so trichotillomania is pretty much the same. Again, I think because we don't remember what the word means, we now have hair pulling after the name. Um, and now we have excoriation disorder, which is essentially is a variant of people who, you know, do skin picking, repetitive skin picking. Okay, again, so we, we have a new category, some new disorders. Um, they've sort of um, OCD, um, many of them basically have more choices for in levels of insight. Um, and trichotillomania is no longer an impulse control disorder. Okay, trauma now has its own category. Okay, so reactive attachment disorder, which is a description of mostly toddlers who have had uh, significant abuse or neglect early on, and this is a description of sort of their behavior and this idea that they have a trouble attaching to caregivers. So this is pretty similar to the one that we used to have. The main difference is they decided to have another one. So these kids are inhibited, won't bond with anybody, don't go to people for help, you know, they're sort of... Uh, isolated and not very socially interactive. These kids are too inhibited and don't have the normal screens around seeing strange. These are the kids who, you know, four seconds after you meet them are hugging you and telling you they love you and want to go home with you. Um, the argument here is, although they're both essentially thought to be caused by significant abuse and neglect early on, that they're different enough disorders that they warrant being categorized differently so that people can sort of look at what the difference is. Some of us who work in child are less 
convinced of this and really wish they had actually gotten around to having a description of attachment disorder that was good past the age of four. Because basically right now, if you these descriptions are very good for toddlers and preschoolers, but looking at some 15-year-old that you're pretty sure has an attachment problem, there's no good diagnosis to give them in that area. But this is sort of what got. Okay, so they modified PTSD and basically the couple things they did is you now, there's a set of criteria if you're older than six, and there's a set of criteria if you're younger than six. They've made it a little clearer about what counts as trauma. Okay, and they have some more distinct categories of symptoms. Okay, and you can code them whether they have dissociative symptoms or not. And you can code whether they have delayed expression, meaning that they were traumatized four years ago, but now, only now, are they starting to have symptoms. Okay. The ones under six, are their description is a little more developmentally sensitive to try and get at the fact that there was essentially clear agreement that kids under six were, did, were, did have PTSD, but there was no good way to give them the diagnosis because they didn't meet the criteria because the criteria weren't developmentally sensitive enough. Um, similar co uh, specifiers. Um, acute stress disorder, a similar thing in that they made it clear what counts as trauma. So for example, no longer for any of these, unless you have extending circumstances, you know, watching things blow up on TV does not count anymore, even if they are real people being blown up. Um, this is all around the whole challenger thing where basically people were arguing that kids had PTSD from just watching it. They had no association with the challenger and didn't know anyone on it. Uh, but it's trying to make it a little uh, clearer. Okay, adjustment disorder got put in this category and it now basically arguing with a little tighter criterion description of that basically this is a disorder related to having a stress and not being able to manage that stress. Okay. And then you can, the coders are pretty much, and the specifiers are pretty much the same as they used to be. Okay, so again, we split reactive attachment into two different diagnoses. The, the, I didn't mention this, the other argument is the original one is similar to being, it's more similar to being depressed and kind of internalizing, and the disinhibited kids are more similar to ADHD and sort of disruptive kids. Okay, um, so, no longer for PTSD do you have to recognize that you're in danger of dying. This is to get at the military problem because the military don't think of this this way, but clearly many of them really do have PTSD. And then that the, the symptoms are a little better organized and into these three clusters, I mean four clusters, and again, sort of trying to make the diagnosis more uh, developmentally sensitive for young kids. Um, Similar thing with acute stress and then um, adjustment disorder. Okay, so then we still have the, the section for dissociative disorders. Uh, disappointing all of the people who don't believe in dissociative identity disorder. Um, okay, but the, again, the description is pretty similar. The, the added on part is you can have gaps for just everyday events as opposed to sort of trauma. Okay, they put in additional language that talks about it can't be a cultural phenomenon, it can't be related to your religion, and for children it can't be imaginary friends or sort of a fantasy play or those kind of things. Okay, dissociative anemia is pretty much the same. Okay, and you code, they got rid of dissociative fugue and now it's a specifier for amnesia. Okay, and that they added on, so depersonalization became a very long disorder, so now it's depersonalization and derealization disorder. And again, it's this idea that you don't sort of realize, you don't feel like you're there and you don't you know, feel like yourself. Okay, so they changed some of the names. Um, you know, the fugue is now a specifier. Okay, and again, sort of more of an emphasis on, it can be just having problems remembering or under, you know, being involved in everyday events and stronger language about culture. Okay, so then we have the somatic symptom and related disorders section. Um, I'm going to briefly whip through this, although this pro pretty much comes up mostly in sort of medical settings. So basically, uh, we used to have a number of these disorders, now we only have a couple. 
So this one is essentially the bottom line is you have multiple physical symptoms that do not have any kind of medical es explanation or are excessive for whatever medical problem you happen to have and that you're very anxious about them and you spend a tremendous amount of time and energy managing these things and you can specify whether you have pain or not and then you code how severe they are. Okay. You can have illness anxiety disorder, which is essentially the new version of being a hypochondriac. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, you're worried about being ill, but you don't really have any physical symptoms. Um, and you spend a lot of time, I guess, trying, you know, trying to maintain or warding off you know, illness kind of thing or being healthy. And you can specify whether you are a care-seeking type or you're not, going, you're not getting care. So conversion disorder now has this functional neurological symptom disorder. Um, these tend to be the people who have seizures without any organic cause, um, sort of more neurological symptoms. And then we now have multiple ways of coding them, which I'm not going to go into, but are here. Um, and, you can, and it used to be for conversion disorder, you had to have an identified psychological stressor. You no longer do. You can just code whether they have one or not. Okay. And then it used to, this uh, psychological factors affecting other medical conditions used to be as in the study section and is now in a disorder one. And basically this is the, the issue where you think whatever the mental health issue is, is related to some sort of psychological issue about whatever the medical problem is. Okay. So for example, you're a diabetic and you won't take your insulin or you won't take it reliably or you won't check your blood sugar or you continue to eat if you're an adolescent, you know, pizza endlessly. Um, you know, this is the idea that that, to code that kind of problem. Okay, factitious disorder is the idea of these people where they deliberately do things to make themselves sick, either medically sick or um, uh, psychologically ill, uh, and come into the hospital system or healthcare system we now, uh, we used to call this factitious disorder and factitious disorder by proxy, and the prior name to that was Munchausers. We now call it factitious disorder imposed on self. So that means you're doing it to yourself. And then you can have factitious disorder imposed on another. So this is the category of mostly adults doing this to their children. Um, we in child are struggling with this one a little bit because basically the person doing it gets the diagnosis. <laughs> But usually what happened is it's the child sitting in the hospital system. So, um, and we in the DSM-5 didn't really go into what to do with the kid. In pediatrics, what happens is the kid gets coded as being a victim of child abuse. Okay. So we basically reorganized this category and we renamed some of the things. And um, we, the emphasis now is more on having maladaptive thoughts and feelings and behavior around medical symptoms or problems as opposed to what we used to spend a lot of time was on this person had medical problems or physical problems and we couldn't explain them with an organic medical problem. Okay. Um, I'm not, that goes into a little more detail. Okay, then we have the section of feeding and eating disorders. I'm gonna whip through the child ones. I'm gonna say that again, how we classify most of the feeding disorders, which are basically usually used for little kids, doesn't really match how the people who work with feeding disorders actually do this. And for example, pediatrics has a whole system where they think about it in relationship with the adult because most feeding problems in kids under the age of five are really related to the relationship they have with the adult. Um, so these tend to be not as useful as they could be. One exception would be pica. So pica is basically just eating things you're not supposed to be eating that are non-food, that are inappropriate for your developmental level, and are not culturally or socially normative. I, so with that, I think they're trying to get at, so as Dr. Bona mentioned, I'm not from here. When I first moved here, eating cornstarch was like a, or red clay was just like, Took me a while to get used to that whole idea, but I think you know, as long as it's not causing problems, then you don't really get the diagnosis. Um, and the reality is, most people who get this diagnosis have another problem, and usually it is a developmental disability or some major 
problem like, you know, you're uh, very psychotic. Okay, rumination disorder doesn't have a lot of research on it. It really is, it's sort of like the cow phenomenon. It's the idea that, you know, cows have like four stomachs or something, and they eat stuff, and it goes into a stomach, and then it comes back up, and they eat it some more, and not totally up on cows, but that's sort of it. Uh, but this is the idea of the kid keeps bringing up the food and sort of chewing on it, and it's not related to some other problem. Uh, this doesn't get used much, even for a child psychiatrist, because um, A, it's really hard to notice this in particular, and usually there are other problems. And again, it usually is in the context of it, some, it's infants, it's in the context of an impaired relationship with their caretaker. Okay, this is essentially our version of failure to thrive, which has to do with kids who don't eat enough for various reasons that are not uh, related to medical problems. Um, so basically, it's you know they're either losing weight or failing to gain, and they don't uh, their their nutrition and eating is inadequate. Okay, anorexia pretty much stayed the same. The main differences are um, we uh, don't have as much criteria around what weight you have to be. It just has to be below normal, and now what for what is expected for your age and size, and you, we uh, now are coding people for severity based on their BMI, which is a measure that looks at not only how much you weigh, but how tall you are. Uh, because while some weights, no matter how tall you are, you'll be overweight, right? Some weights, if you're you know, eight feet tall, you're probably normal. Um, so uh, bulimia, again, is pretty similar. The diagnostic criteria pretty much stayed the same. The main difference is you now code their severity based on how, ma how many episodes of inappropriate comp compensation they do per week, meaning so how often are they throwing up, how often are they taking laxatives, you know, those kinds of things. Okay. Binge eating disorder used to be in the study section and got moved into this. This is the idea that you binge eat, but you don't, try and compensate unlike bulimia. Um, so you aren't throwing up, you aren't taking laxatives, you're just um, having episodes where you eat a lot. Um, and again, you're c being coded on the frequency that you d demonstrate this behavior. Okay. Um, so some expanded criteria. Oh, I forgot to mention. So uh, anorexia, you no longer have to be amenorrheic, meaning that you've lost your period. Okay. Uh, they have more descriptions about how you decide this person has a low body weight. Um, and bule it's a little easier to be, be bulimic. Okay, and in conceptually, uh, binge eating disorder and bulimia are actually thought to be very similar to disorders. It's just that one, one set of people compensate and the other set do not. Okay, elimination disorders pretty much stayed the same. So this is kids who wet the bed or have enuresis, either daytime or nighttime, and kids who have problem with fecal soiling, which is encapresis. Okay, the main difference, I'm not gonna go through this, but um, the main difference is they got their own category, um, being special. Okay, so sleep, wake, they've basically reorganized this. Um, Maybe not the most helpful way, but they have reorganized it. Okay, so now you just can have insomnia. We used to have like primary insomnia and secondary insomnia. Now we just now you just have trouble go sleeping. Okay, and you either have trouble start going to sleep, staying asleep, or you know waking up early. Again, you have to be impaired, and then you can code whether you have another medical uh, mental health problem, another medical problem, or another sleep problem. Um, you can have hypersomnolence disorder. This means you sleep too much. Um, again, you can code what the specifiers are. You can have narco and then narcolepsy, which is this idea of you fall asleep during the day, but also you have cataplexy, which means you lose your motor tone. Now, some of us feel this is a little excessive, but we now you now can specify <laughs> if you have certain kind of you know, hormone deficiencies, you have certain sorts of genetic problems. Um, anyway, that's the list of specifiers. Um, and then the severity is how frequent it is. Then they have a list of, of sleep disorders that are really based on having some sort of structural 
problem that interferes with your sleep. So basically, this is essentially the new name for sleep apnea. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Um, you can have central sleep apnea, meaning it's your brain and not some obstruction in your throat. And you can specify a number of specifications. You can have sleep-related uh, hypoventilation, meaning you don't breathe enough. OK, circadian rhythm sleep-wake is basically to sort of capture these people where it's just they're out of phase for where they're supposed to be. So no longer, like this is jet lag, although this is no longer a specifier. So this is adolescents who insist on staying up till 2 in the morning because that's what they, they like that and they feel great. But that doesn't really match their schedule where they're supposed to be getting back up at 6 o'clock in the morning to truck off to high school to learn, right? Um, so it's, you know, shift workers and that kind of thing. But basically it means you're not on some regular sleep cycle that matches what you're supposed to be doing in your environment. Okay, and then you can have non-rapid eye movement. Um, oh, let me go back to this. We used to have uh, a disorder called sleep terror which is basically mostly in kids where they basically would start screaming and clearly be having a nightmare, but the kid didn't wake up. So the mo it was mostly distressing for the adults. It now, that has now got been as now a subcategory of this overall disorder. This is also where, like sleepwalking as a type of this disorder. Um, and so now you just code this as, uh, as part of the overall disorder. You can still have nightmare disorder, which essentially means you have too many nightmares for too long of a time. And you can specify you know, uh, how those occur and what they're associated with. Um, you can have a rapid eye movement, sleep dis behavior disorder. Um, and uh, so this is the one that basically, usually during rapid eye movement, your motor movement's inhibited so you don't move. This is the disorder that everyone is using in the criminal justice system to argue why they killed their wife, but they were really asleep because it was a nightmare and they thought that she was attacking them. Um, okay, uh, restless legs moved into this category. And basically this is the idea, you, you feel the urge to move your legs. It's very uncomfortable, it Im impedes your sleep. Okay. So basically, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but they've sort of reorganized it, relabeled some of them. Some of the disorders got condensed. Some of them got, um, got expanded. Um, OK, I'm really going to whip through this one, uh, mostly because, you know, particularly in child, we don't really use any of these. And uh, I'd say most people in the systems we work in aren't really coming in for this problem. OK. So um, they're still, and they, what they've done is reorganized them and labeled them a little differently. So there's still delayed ejaculation, erectile disorder, female orgasmic disorder, female sexual interest arousal disorder, general pelvic pain penetration disorder, male, male hypoactive sexual disorder, premature ejaculation. Okay, so what they did is they added some more, basically more disorders for women because if you look at the four, it's mostly about men. And uh, they um, you know, renamed some of them to be a little more precise. They gave more information about sort of what it means to be impaired in severity and additional information about you know, it does matter if you have a partner and you're in a relationship and some of the other variables that might be affecting these, these types of disorders. And then you can code them whether they're lifelong or or acquired and whether they're generalizable, meaning it happens all the time or whether it's situational. Okay, gender dysphoria, um, they've sort of renamed and reconceptualized somewhat this. So this really has to do with the increasing um, thought and there's some evidence about this that, that this is not necessarily as, nor as abnormal as it has been in terms of classifying it. And there's this argument that what gender people feel that they are is biologically driven and not, there's a uh, sort of group that feels it's not necessarily an abnormality. Okay, so we now have a category that is gender dysphoria in children. Basically, this you know, is essentially the idea that you know what your gender is, and you essentially don't feel like 
you are. So the most, you know, common, I mean, the most one that people identify with is, you know, you are a boy, but you feel like a girl. And that it is distressing. And you can specify whether it's with a disorder of sex development. So these are these kids where they have some sort of chromosomal or physiological abnormality, often identified at birth, that has affected their, um, either their internal sense of gender or their uh, genitalia development. Okay, and then you have gender dysphoria in adults, which again is the similar category. And you can specify again whether they have a, a sex development disorder and you can specify whether they're post-transition. So this is the, these are the people who have got, undergone um, medical treatment and surgical treatment to change into whatever gender it is they feel that best matches their internal state. Okay, so it gets its own category. It used to be mostly in the kids section. Um, it's mostly talking about the internal feeling that the person feels like it doesn't match as opposed to ex some external things like you identify with girls or you identify with boys, okay? Um, that it, we used to subtype about what kind of sexual orientation you have, meaning whether you preferred, uh, whether you preferred an opposite sex to you or the same sex or both sexes. We don't do that anymore. Um, and that it, more around what their people's internal state is as opposed to what they are actually expressing. Okay, so then um, for some reason this category doesn't get its own slide, forgot introductory slide, not sure about that. I'm not fond of this category, so maybe that's it. So anyway, oppositional defined disorder is basically got the same criteria. These are basically the kids who are running around being difficult and refusing to do whatever the adult wants them to do. Um, the criteria have been grouped a little better and organized. Um, again, it has to be above what is expected developmentally. It has to be distressing and causing impairments. And now you code by how many settings the kid has problems in. Again, to get after the problem of some kids are really difficult at school and fine at home and vice versa. Okay, intermittent explosive disorder, which is this idea that you go into rages for no apparent reason. Um, now includes, you can include sort of just being verbally aggressive. You can include a wider range of behavioral problems. Uh, that it's not premeditated aggression, and you have to be older than six, again, to target this, this set of, well, most kids outgrow sort of temper tantrums by the age of four or five. You know, there are still some basically okay kids who are still having tantrums at six or so. Um, okay, so conic disorder is this idea that um, you are a baby criminal. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is that you have a repetitive, persistent behavior pattern. You have more than three symptoms. They last at least a year. Um, and they're in these categories of being aggressive to people or animals, destroying property, being deceitful or stealing, and violating the rules. You have to be impaired. Um, you, can, you can get it if you're older eight, than 18, but you can't meet the antisocial personality disorder criteria. And you can specify whether it's childhood or, onset, um, childhood or adolescent onset. They've added this specifier that uh, goes after, that's called limited prosocial emotions, and this is to go after the sort of lack of empathy and remorse. So previously, that was a criteria in antisocial personality disorder, but it was not in conduct disorder. And it's really, I think, trying to get at so many conduct disorder kids uh, really um, don't have problems with empathy and they're not really antisocial. What they are is having problems with their behavior, which may or may not be, I mean, well, varies on their level of environmental reinforcement for that behavior. Um, so you can code them as mild, moderate, and severe. Um, pyromania, uh, basically. You just have to set one fire on purpose. Um, anyway, so the, <laughs> um, so pyromania is pretty much the same. Kleptomania is pretty much the same. That means you're stealing stuff. Okay, so it gets its own category. We've now moved in the impulsive control and disruptive disorders. The idea is these are all disorders that have some level of emotional and behavioral self-control problems. 
Propositional defiant, we sort of did a better job of categorizing what type they are. Um, and the conduct order, um, intermittent explosive, we sort of uh, gave more language to what kind of what counts as an outburst, and that you have to be impaired, and that you have to you can't be under six. Okay, so substance use has its own ca category. We're now calling it substance related and addictive disorders. Okay, so the big changes here are that. We are no longer calling, people no longer have substance abuse or dependence. They have a substance use disorder. This is to go after that functionally there was not really a lot of difference between abuse and dependence. And it didn't make, it wasn't particularly helpful in thinking about what the problem was or thinking about how to help people or manage them. So now you basically have this category and then you can specify like whether uh, or describe whether the person's intoxicated, whether the person's withdrawing, or whether it's sort of their ongoing use. You can specify if they're in remission. You can specify whether they're in some sort of controlled environment or on maintenance therapy. And you do severity by how many symptoms they have. These are the symptoms that uh, substances that allow you to have a substance use disorder. There is a category of other. So caffeine. <laughs> Wow. So caffeine is, you can have caffeine intoxication, you can have caffeine withdrawal. Wow. Caffeine use so. disorder is in the study section, so it's not actually a diagnosis at this point. Um, yeah, I'm just, you know, anyway. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it is true it exists. People can get physiologically dependent on caffeine, and like in my case, you can be both physiologically and psychologically dependent on it. but. Um, you know, so there is an, I mean, basically the argument is that this is, can be impairing. Okay. The substances vary on sort of what the names of, I mean, what, what are the or, names of the disorders that you can have. So for example, with some of the, you know, like PCP, you can, you can say, you know, they have a hallucinogen disorder, depending on what their symptoms are. Um, you classify them based on how many existing symptoms they have, and then you also classify whether they're in any state of remission. Okay, the other thing that made it into this category is non-substance related disorders, and the, that basically is gambling disorder. So basically it's the idea that you, know, you can't stop and you've lost all your money and still are going, but you have more than four symptoms, you have them for 12 months, and then you can sort of code, whether it's episodic, whether they're in remission, um, you know, what's, how severity are. Um, and so again, basically, you know, they added something that, you know, they added marijuana and caffeine withdrawal to the list. But basically, in the substance use disorders, you're looking at how severe people are and whether they're in the category of their symptoms are based on their withdraw they're intoxicated, they're withdrawing, or they're continuing to you know, use and have symptoms. Okay. We know you no longer need criteria around having legal problems. They've put in uh, descriptions of sort of uh, craving and desire to use. They changed the threshold. Um, and again, eliminated sort of the dependence and the polysubstance and added specifiers about, you know, are you basically sober because you locked up? Um, okay. So then there's a category of neurocognitive disorders, which essentially used to be the dementia category and delirium. So there's delirium, which basically for the most part means you have some medical problem that is in interfering with your ability to sort of uh, attend to reality, uh, you, know, um, under, you know, be cognitively intact and sort of mansion. You can specify why you think the person is delirious and you can specify how chronic it is and you can specify sort of how active they are. And the other category is now you have a neurocognitive disorder and you either have a mild one or you have a major one. And that basically, that the criteria covered these cognitive domains, um, and it looks at sort of do you have symptoms in these areas of function. So major neurocognitive disorder is basically that you ha have a decline from your previous cognitive performance in more than one domain that 
various people are worried about it and that it is impairing your cognitive abilities and ability to sort of um, think and manage life and you are you having trouble managing daily life and you're not delirious. Okay. Mild means that you have some decline. People are worried about it. You have some demonstration on sort of testing and performance criteria, but you are still able to manage being independent and self-sufficient at whatever your developmental level is. Okay, and then you, su so you give the person major or mild, and then you subtype based on what disorder they have, what disease they have, and this is essentially the list of diseases that you can have. So it's no longer, you know, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's type. It's you have major cognitive, mineral cognitive disorder, and then you subtype it as Alzheimer's. Okay, you can specify whether it's with or without behavioral disturbances. And then if, if you have major disorder, major neurocognitive disorder, you can specify, you know, what their severity is with basic living skills. Okay, so basically we renamed it. Uh, we sort of included uh, dementia. We have a broader range of uh, etiologies, and basically the descriptions were broadened to try and get at a broader age range. Because part of the problem, for example, it is actually possible to have a 17-year-old who is demented, but in the old DSM-4, there was actually no way to give them that diagnosis. Okay, and it's a wider spectrum of function, so you can now have the mild. You can have mild. Okay. Okay. So the personality disorders, I'm going to mention them. It's important to know, despite lots of time and money and energy being spent on the personality disorders, they didn't actually change anything. So um, the only difference is there's no longer access to to code them on, so they're just listed with everything else. But we have the same ones. Um, again, it's this idea that you have an enduring pattern of both your inner experiences and your behavior that is maladaptive and relatively rigid that causes you problems across, you know, across the board and also causes you distress, okay? And I'm, um, in the interest of all of us, I'm not gonna go through them all because they're pretty much the same as the four. Okay, what they did do is all that work went into section two, three, which we'll get to in a minute, in hopes that people will use this, this new approach. So I guess with DSM 5.1, they can change the personality disorders. Basically, it got all the way, so I won't digress into the total process, but the Board of Trustees had to vote off on what was going to happen, and this, the new version got all the way up there, and then the Board decided not to endorse it. Okay, so we have the section of the paraphilic disorders. Uh, this is the list of them. I'm not going to really go into that. Okay, so it's not an exhaustive list. So they've, in the DSM-5, they've listed the ones that are relatively common and the ones that tend to be regarded as criminal behavior because they usually involve other people and those other people are not willing participants. Okay, so paraphilia is basically, you know, described as an intense and persistent sexual interest in stuff that essentially is not considered normal sexual behavior or the broad range of normal. Okay, so what the five spends a lot of time on is making the distinction between that is necessary to have the disorder, but it's not enough. And to have the disorder, you either have to be distressed as the person with the problem, or you have to be in causing distress or impairment to other people, okay? And that your satisfaction and sort of sexual satis uh, you know, uh, energy and satisfaction ha involves harming or, or um, hurting other people, okay? Um, and these are the ones that they're talking about. I'm not gonna really go into it. I mean, um, you know, the one, particularly in child, we care the most about is sort of involving children and stuff that uh, they should not be involved in. Okay. Um, the other um, difference, okay, so the other uh, just key point is being a transvestite in four used to be you had to be male. So this is the idea is you get sexually aroused by cross-dressing and associated behavior. Now it's more fair so anyone can have it. So women can also be transvestites. <laughs> Okay, again, you can specify for all these disorders whether it's in a controlled environment, whether it's in remission, okay. But again, lots of emphasis on the fact is you can have a paraphilia and not have a disorder if you are not 
harming anybody or you're not in distress. Um, so in child, for example, this is getting into this very problematic area, which is a problematic area in, in uh, forensics, is you, by definition, have a paraphilia around children, but you don't actually do anything. So if you don't do anything, you don't really have a disorder, right? Um, and what to do about those people. OK, so then there's a section of basically medication-induced movement disorders and other adverse effects of medicine. So basically, the person has some type of problem directly related to either having a movement disorder or taking some medicine. And this is the list of them. Um, OK, so the main difference is they get their own category. OK, then other conditions that may be a focus for clinical attention. OK, so this is essentially what Access 4 used to be. So what they've done is it's a much longer list, and there are many subtypes in them. So basically, you can have a relational problem. You can be abused or neglected. You can have problems with housing or education or your work. You can have other problems related to your social environment. You can have problems with uh, crime or legal system, problems related to health care, problems related to other, you know, basically other. And then uh, I'm not going to go into them, but it, they're all listed. But you can basically put, you can just, you just put this on the list of what you consider a problem. There are a lot of them. So to be fair to the DSM-5, they did actually recognize that people live in environments, and that does make a difference to how things go and what kind of problems you have. And it does, it is a better class, it is a bet, there are more descriptive, so you can be more specific about what you think is going on that's impacting this person's mental health. Okay, so in section three, they essentially put everything that they want people to do that they couldn't really get into the diagnostic section, the disorder section. Okay, so they have a couple of different measures that they are encouraging people to use to try and get a better sense of, so one of the problems in mental health and psychiatry, right, is that, um, that there's heterogeneity and, uh, within disorders and, out, and, across, and there are similar symptoms across disorders, right? So for example, in child, this is a common problem is that lots of pro lot, children with lots of different disorders have attentional problems, right? Just because you have an attentional problem does not mean you have ADHD. Um, and that, you know, being an ADHD kid, you can stand two ADHD kids next to each other and they can look completely different other than the, pro other than the fact that they're having trouble paying attention. So basically, they have a couple measures that they're hoping people will fill out to try and help people to think about the idea of what, what symptoms are similar across problems and what, sim, what uh, symptoms are different within the same, people with the same problem. They have this uh, uh, scale that we mentioned earlier about how to rate psychotic symptoms. And then they have provided the disability as, uh, assessment scale that they are encouraged people to use. So there, the WHO has done an adult one. They, the DSM-5 set developed a child version, but it's not out yet because the WHO hasn't approved it yet. The child one is completed by an adult. OK. Um, the WHO basically uh, looks at these domains. You know, Can you understand others and communicate? Can you get around? Can you provide self-care? Can you? Uh, work things out with other people? Can you manage your life? And you, do you participate in society? They also have a section on talking about how to think about cultural issues and factors, how to interview people around those issues. Um, they give you lots of help with this, um, this being a challenge in the practice of medicine for us, and ways of thinking about how to conceptualize various types of problems. For the personality thing, they essentially gave the model that they tried to put in the five, which is basically a um, integration of a dimensional and categorical approach. So what's currently in the personality dissection is a categorical approach, right? You're considered paranoid, or you're considered histrionic, or you're considered borderline. What people don't like about that in real life is there's so, many, there's so much overlap that it's often difficult to get a person into one personality disorder, and that this classification system has a more of an emphasis on how functional are you and what kind of traits do you have 
and sort of how does that um, work with your interaction problems and your problems in managing life. Um, one of the difficulties was it was difficult for them to get a model in terms of looking at traits that was actually manageable for clinicians to use that would not have involved them, you know, f listing 400 things and then coding them in different places because there was this fear that, quite realistically, I think that no one would be doing that. Um, and, it could be, and a lot of this was actually done by a particular person who has done research demonstrating that almost no clinicians actually uh, look at the criteria. They sort of look at the person, get enough information, and then they put the person in the category without actually going through and reading through all the personality disorder criteria. Um, anyway, but this is more about what, it's more an emphasis on a dimensional approach and sort of what are your traits and sort of how does that impact your function. And then they came up with six personality types, um, which are listed here. Um, OK. Then they have a section which are called conditions for further study. So we had this section in the four, and that's where some of these other disorders, some of the disorders came out after enough study where people agreed that they seemed to be, um, you know, a discrete disorder that um, made sense. So there's an attenuated psychosis syndrome. Right. So this basically means you're kind of softly psychotic. I mean, that you have some psychotic symptoms, but you seem pretty much still intact and that you still are functional. This is to somewhat get at, this is a huge area of interest, particularly for us in child, of trying to be able to identify people who are on their way to becoming schizophrenic and trying to see, get them early enough to actually intervene to do something that would hopefully derail that process. So I think this is a way to try and give people a diagnosis that they can give kids or other people and sort of try and look at what would be helpful. Um, basically, de uh, being depressed with hypomania, but the hypomania doesn't meet the criteria cr currently for the, what uh, we require. Um, basically, having persistent complex bereavement disorder I mean, you don't meet the criteria for major depression, but you're still significantly impaired longer than what we typically expect people to do. So if you look at bereavement, people can still be quite sad about losing a person and still have issues, but most people within a fairly short period of time become functional. They may be sad and they may be anxious and they and that may be chronic, but they can manage, they go back to managing life. Okay, again, caffeine disorder is in this section to be studied. Internet gambling, gaming is in this section. There's lots of debate, particularly in the adolescent world, about whether this is truly a problem or not, but this is the idea that you are, you become addicted to playing video games, uh, mostly multiplayer expensive games. Um, <laughs> So uh, then there's neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. Again, this is trying to give people a better, uh, yeah. another sort of category for these kids where they don't meet the criteria for fetal alcohol syndrome, but they clearly still are impaired based on the exposure. And then suicidal behavioral disorder. Um, I'd say that you know the field is really trying to struggle with suicide and trying to better understand this, and particularly better understand people where it's sort of a chronic problem and it doesn't seem to match the severity of their psychiatric disorder. Um, and then non-suicidal self-injury. So again, this is around you know people who do stuff like cutting and those kinds of things, and having a better a way of giving them a provisional diagnosis and sort of being able to study that and look at it. Um, Okay, so then there's an appendix, and basically it goes through, there's a sec they basically have a chapter that talks about what's changed. They go through, a, they have a glossary of explaining the terms. They have a glossary of con uh, cultural concepts of distress, and then they have the various alphabetical listing, nu numerical listing, one for the nine, one for the 10, and then they list everybody who contributed, okay. So again, I just want to stress that I think that um, the DSM is important, and I'm certainly not minimizing that, but there's more to sort of assessing a person and deciding what's going on, both in terms of what is their problem 
and their function, and that really it is not very rare um, to be able to be absolutely certain what is wrong with this person um, immediately. And that I think that we need to remember that you can't evaluate people out, out of their context, and you really need to understand their context. Um, and that the DSM is really one tool to do that, and that you really need to be doing these other things. You really need to learn how to talk to people. You really need to learn how to listen to them. Um, and you really need to sort of think about how to have a comprehensive idea about what's going on. Um, the DSM, there are a number of references. These are all off the American Psychiatric Association page. They have their own page with the DSM-5, which has additional information. Um, you can get a subscription to the DSM, and you can, either, you can either buy the hardback book or you can buy an online version. Unlike many books, you don't get both. You either get one or the other, unless you want to buy them, you know, pay double. Um, essentially, and then there's additional information you can subscribe to. Um, and since I'm fond of um, Calvin and Hobbes. Um, so that's a rather lengthy sort of whip through of the DSM-5. Does anybody have any questions or things that would be helpful to talk about? Yeah. So uh, there was a lot of controversy about the DSM-5, how it was put together, all the study sections, and ultimately how it came out, questions about the reliability and validity. You, you glossed over a minute how it was done. I don't want to suck you into the whole detail. But can you tell the audience a little bit about the process for coming up with the new DSM-5? Uh, you can probably help me with this. But in general, what happened is the APA collected experts in various areas, and there were people put in charge of, so there was a set of people in charge of depression, there was a set of people in charge of bipolar, and so there were a number of these different groups composed of experts, and that basically they, I don't want to say just sat around and talked, but essentially, you know, did research, came with their opinions, and as a group came up with a consensus of what they thought should happen with various disorders. Then a certain number of disorders were field tested, meaning that the APA had mostly universities do diagnostic assessments to see if the new criteria, how it did compared to the old criteria, and sort of did it capture what people wanted it to do. And then that information went back to the groups and they sort of refined what they did. And then they came up with proposals. Uh, they're, they're, they're more layers to this, but essentially then what happened is they presented that to the APA board that signed off on the, on the plan. This is what happened to the personality disorders one. They spent a lot of time, effort, got this whole plan, but when it got to the trustees or the board, they essentially refused to endorse it, so it went back into the study section. So it's essentially um, expert opinion ba supplemented by, some, you know, both existing research and new research they did to sort of test out various ideas. Yeah? Uh, where does the schizophrenic patient with negative symptoms and cognitive deficits fit in this panorama here? When, when, you, when you went over schizophrenia, it looked like only positive symptoms have been Um So again, you know, I'm not an adult person, but my understanding, and Joe can help me here, is Somewhere in your history of being schizophrenic, you have to have had a positive symptom. I think that the current consensus of the field is that uh, if you're truly schizophrenic, at some point you had positive symptoms. If you can still make the criteria for this disorder now, but what you get specified, you, there's that specifier that says in remission or partial remission. But I think that's the general sense that you want one of these, that uh, at some point, I mean, to, this disorder is really bo includes both. So, John, what I would add is I was on the schizophrenia um, study section. And so five years ago, there was a decision among some of the leaders and thought leaders in schizophrenia to maybe just blow up the entire criteria and pull away the idea of positive and negative symptoms and sort of ask people to think about schizophrenia as a dysfunctional thought disorder across the spectrum which would include people in the prodrome all the way through 
folks that are late stage of the illness. It made everybody go crazy because the research had really never supported that, but we do know bits and pieces of it across the spectrum. The ultimate decision was to leave the criteria generally the same, okay? Leave the criteria generally the same and to minimize the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So you really have, as, as Dr. Dingle said, you really have to show at some point positive symptoms. You have to show broad dysfunction, but there is no requirement for negative symptoms of schizophrenia. And the reason being that there are a fair number of research studies to show that you can have all the symptoms of schizophrenia without any negative symptoms. And so the, you know, the study section said, well, then we have to consider a way to keep negative symptoms off the criteria. So I think that's probably the, the long story as to what you see today. My guess will be at 5.304, you're going to see a complete blow up of the thought disorder section. And things like schizoaffective disorder, um, some of those other psychotic illnesses are all going to be homogenized across the spectrum. Right. Right. I think there's some thought that it will eventually end up like autism spectrum disorder, where basically it gets to be one disorder and you are at various levels. Any other question? Okay. You've been a great audience. Thanks.